Okay, if everyone can take their seat, we are almost ready to start. So good morning again, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to the first session of the 2022 SDG 16 conference, where we will be discussing ways to prevent conflict and sustain peace in an increasingly fragile world. I am Ilaria Bottigliero, the director of IDLO's Department of Research and Learning, and I'm very pleased to welcome a lineup of very distinguished speakers from across sectors and regions who will share their insight on how we can address the root causes of conflict, reduce fragilities, and put ourselves on the path of a more just, peaceful, and sustainable future. Today with us, we are very, very lucky to have Ms. Leima Bowie, the founder of Women of Liberia Mass Action for Peace, and founder and president of the Bowie Peace Foundation Africa. Welcome. We also have Ambassador Cindy McCain, the permanent representative of the US mission to the UN agencies in Rome. Very warm welcome. Ms. Lynn Rose Jane Jenon, faculty of Mindanao State University, Iligan Institute of Technology. Welcome. We also have Ms. Emanuela Claudia Del Rey, the EU Special Representative for the Sahel. Very warm welcome. Mr. Helder Da Costa, the General Secretary of the G7 Plus Secretariat. Welcome. And then online, we have His Excellency Minister Gamal Mohamed Hassan, Minister of Planning, Investment and Economic Development of Somalia. Also joining online, Ms. Elizabeth Spehar, Assistant Secretary General for Peacebuilding Support at the United Nations Department of Political Affairs. And joining online, Mr. Diego Garcia Sayan, United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Independence of Judges and Lawyers. Before beginning uh, with our discussion and our panel, I have a very few housekeeping points. For audience members in the room, you will see uh, three of the conference floor staff around the room. And uh, if you would like to make an intervention or ask a question to the panel, please call them over and our secretariat will inscribe you on the speakers list. If you are joining us virtually and have a question for one of our panelists or a general question for all of the panel, please submit your question using the Q&A function. When submitting a question, please include your name and affiliated organization. Please do not use the chat function to submit questions. There is a dedicated Q&A function. Now, uh, without further ado, let's turn to our panelists. Our first panelist is Ms. Lema Bowie. Ms. Bowie, in the early 2000s, you led the women's peace movement that was decisive in ending the Liberian Civil War, an achievement for which you were awarded a 2011 Nobel Peace Prize. Since then, you have continued to be a leading voice on women's empowerment and inclusive peace building. So based on your experience, what recommendations do you have on how to ensure women's equal representation in conflict resolution and peace building efforts? And why is it critical that women participate in and lead these processes? Ms. Bowie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm unmasking for a moment or else I'll faint. Um, growing up in Liberia, a common feature was the abuse of women without any laws. Until the, the early 2000s, we didn't have a law on rape, 
no law on domestic violence, and no law on inheritance. In the early 2000s, Elizabeth Rand and former President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf did a research on women, war, and peace. And one of the findings of their research was that the impact of conflict on women's lives is a reflection of the interaction during peacetime. So all of the violence in peacetime, peace in quotes, that women experience in their society is exacerbated during conflict. One of the things that I have seen in my work across the world is that conflict, as we all know, is a gendered activity. Women and girls are particularly affected because of their status and their status in society as well as their sex. Some people have a more brutal way of putting why women suffer the way they suffer during conflict. In the moment of establishing peace, I always refer to the RE, reintegration, rehabilitation, reconciliation. So is the RE represents we're doing the world that has just experienced conflict all over again. I think one of the first ways is visibility. We, everyone is talking about Ukraine and we've seen recent visits of very powerful delegation as a sign of solidarity to the president of Ukraine. One of the things we haven't seen in all of those visits, the presence of women. That's the first line of invisibility when we have conflict. This is a conversation that we've been having in every part of the world for decades now. The need to make visible women's presence in conflict processes. At the community level, when wars happen, women are the first responders for peace. And the definition that I would give peace is not just the absence of war, but creating conditions that dignifies the life of people. So when we have war in my own community, the women were the ones finding food. The women were the ones creating safety for fighters. And if you go to the Ukraine, DR Congo, Afghanistan, and all of the different places that are seeing war today, those are the things that women are doing. So if we must include the voices of women, we have to elevate that kind of work that women are doing in these moments. And this is something that we don't see happening. In early 2003, when we were still protesting the war in Ghana, the delegation, the UN mission from Guinea-Bissau were one of the few military groups that we saw elevate the work that women were doing in different communities. And maybe because they were from West Africa, so they could really identify with what those women were doing. So I think that first step. The second thing that I believe is important is funding. And people tend to think that, oh, they're doing grassroots work, so it's not necessary to give them the kind of funding that they need. But sustained funding is necessary to continue to increase the work that women are doing in conflict context. The third thing that I would like to talk about is appointing women at every stage of the conflict. So I talked about the pre-mission assessment, making women faces visible during that assessment period. Most people say, oh, we can't find competent women to serve as mediators and negotiators. Someone please give me a pen and paper. I'll give you a list of over 50 women right now who could do a brilliant job on any kind of conflict. So I think for me, the two key words, visibility, support in every sphere of peace mission, conflict prevention and interaction. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, uh, Bowie. Yes, it's wonderful to, 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 to hear the call 
to reduce and eliminate the invisibility of women and also to uh, give them and elevate the work that women are doing in their communities to the proper level so that they can uh, uh, be represented at the highest level also in peace building and post-conflict activities. So thank you so much for stressing this point. Um, Ambassador McCain, um, an important but often overlooked aspect of conflict and instability is the impact it has on food security for some of the world's most vulnerable people. Ambassador, you have spoken about food security as a necessary ingredient for overall security and stability. We know that improving livelihoods in rural agricultural communities builds resilience against shocks from conflict, climate change, and COVID-19. The alternatives are hunger, poverty, political instability, and pressure to abandon the land. How is your mission, the US mission to the UN food security agencies in Rome, working to improve food security and prevent conflict? The floor is yours, Ambassador. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you very much. And thank you for having me. Um, I am uh, deeply honored to be on a, on a panel such as this, surrounded by people so notable in their fields. Uh, I, uh, it, to me, it's a, it's a great honor, and it's also a great opportunity to learn from them. Uh, if I may, first of all, I'd like to thank the government of Italy, the International Development Law Organization, and the UN Department of Social and Economic Affairs for inviting me to join this extremely impressive group of panelists. President Biden has defined 2022 as a year of action for democracy, for combating corruption, and for promoting respect for human rights. This SDG 16 conference has an important contribution to make to our collective aspirations. Today, if I can leave you with one message, it is this. Food security is, a fun, is fundamental to peace and prosperity, and the rule of law is key in many different ways, but of course, to food security. Food security means that all people at all times have access to enough food for a healthy, productive life. Unfortunately, food insecurity is a daily challenge for hundreds of millions of people around the world. Food insecurity undermines economic development, undermines educational outcomes, and undermines political stability. In the extreme, food insecurity can lead to mass migration, conflict, and radicalism. COVID-19, conflict, and climate change all put enormous strains on global food systems. Now, Russia's unprovoked and unjust aggression against Ukraine is making things much worse. Food prices spiked to record highs in March, according to FAO. And prices could very well stay high for years. The FAO predicts that the next five growing seasons, the next five growing seasons in Ukraine, a major exporter of wheat, corn, and sunflower oil are already in grave danger. My colleague I know that is here from the, Somal the Somali Minister of Planning who will be speaking a little bit later, is better placed to share that skyrocketing food prices, what skyrocketing food, food prices mean for his national budget, for social protection schemes, for individual families that already spend a large percent of, percentage of household income on food. What I can say is that on a global scale, the increased costs are causing World, Pro World Food Program to be extremely worried about having to reduce operations even as the needs are greater than ever before. And let's not forget the 500 million small scale producers around the world who face rapidly rising input costs. They produce 30% of the world's food and up to 80% of the food in Sub-Saharan Africa. The world depends on these farmers but they are facing challenges that make it difficult to stay in business. And so, first and foremost, the ripple effects of, Russian, of Russian, Russia's senseless war are far reaching and catastrophic. Only Russia can put an end to the suffering it continues to cause. 
But as this crisis shines a light on global food security, we also have an important opportunity here to remind the world how strong food systems are at the heart of any thriving community. Agriculture generates jobs, livelihoods, and prosperity. Successful agriculture communities are resilient. They attract and sustain youth. They inspire entrepreneurs. I recently traveled to Kenya and to Madagascar to see how the UN food agencies are working with host governments to make sure rural communities have the tools to not only survive, but to thrive. Those tools include access to markets, technology, and finance. And here's where IDLO and SDG 16 come in. The rule of law and access to justice are both fundamental to success. This means property rights and intellectual rights are secured. This means equal access to public resources is granted. This means corruption is kept in check. And this means that there is accountability when things go wrong. My mission works directly with the UN food security agencies to ensure the right process, processes are in place to promote transparency and inclusion. We count on you to keep working with national and local authorities to make sure they too have the right policies in place, plus the capacity to effectively implement those policies. I'd like to end with a call for a greater investment in the rule of law and access to justice. That's why we're all here. We know the eventual payoff dwarfs the initial costs. And yet with COVID-19 and climate change, and now Russia's war on Ukraine, competition for public resources is going to be stiff. I look forward to hearing from the remaining panelists and welcome any questions and comments on food security, resilience, and peace that you may have. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And thank you especially for highlighting uh, a link that is not necessarily obvious, uh, which is how rule of law and access to justice contribute directly to food security and in turn to sustaining peace and building peace. So thank you so much for your contribution. I'm very pleased now to hand the floor to Ms. Uh, Emanuela de Re, the EU Special Representative for the Sahel. Ms. Del Re, in the Sahel, many root causes and drivers of conflict, such as pervasive impunity, corruption, unequal access to justice, human rights violations, and lack of accountability, stem from or are exacerbated by an absence of the rule of law. What actions do you believe must be taken to strengthen public trust in justice institutions and address grievances that, if not resolved, could lead to greater fragility, instability, and violence. The floor is yours. Okay, now it works. Thank you very much. I am very happy to be here for uh, uh, the third time, I think, because uh, SDG 16 is uh, one of the SDGs, my favorite SDGs, so to speak, if you can have a, a favorite SDG. Uh, of course, when you were mentioning the Sahel, uh, I have to say that we witness certainly often a distorted use of the concept of law. Um, considering that the Sahel uh, is at the moment, as I often define it, uh, the real southern border of, the, uh, of uh, Europe, you can imagine how important it is to concentrate on the region to tackle the major problems. I have to say that there are juridical structures, uh, uh, but and there is also the will to implement reforms, despite, of course, the political uh, recent events that we witnessed. Um, there are programs ag against corruption in Chad, for instance, and Burkina Faso. There are reconciliation processes. Nevertheless, we see that in some cases, unfortunately, the way to solve uh, social, political, and economic crisis is a coup d'état or uh, um, other forms of um, disrespect of uh, uh, the rule of law, which create very serious consequences. 
So, of course, the, co the coordination is uh, absolutely strongly needed to contrast, especially the instrumentalization of justice systems for political motives, which have often been cited as the main reason for subverting the system in favor of approaches that undermine peace and stability. But what can we do in this sense? We can work on principles, but we can also work on interests. An example of interest is the fact that uh, we can have economic advantages from pro promoting human rights and the rule of law, because uh, these would attract investments and would contribute to the implementation of plans and strategies which constitute a consolidated architecture to face the enormous challenges related to governance. When I talk about architecture, I refer to an immense amount of initiatives we often forget. For instance, uh, the SDGs, of course, of Agenda 2030, but also the African Union Vision 2063, ECOWAS, which is the Organization for, for Western Africa, Vision 2025, and other national development frameworks, such as the program Renaissance in Niger. The implementation of the African uh, Union agenda at member states level is often impeded by a lack of institutional capacity and political will. Another contributing factor is a lack of citizens awareness about the obligation that this involves. Several regional and national frameworks for advancing human rights and the rule of law in the Sahel are available. This means that, for instance, we can refer to the 2007 uh, African Union Charter on Democracy, Elections and Governance, uh, um, which is called ACDEG, the 2002 uh, NEPAD, the New Partnership for Africa's Development, Declaration on Democracy, Political, Economic and Corporate Governance, the 2001 ECOWAS protocol on democracy and good governance, but I could go on for quite a long uh, time. For countries in the Sahel, uh, a renewed commitment to strengthening human rights and the rule of law requires first the ratification of the regional and international instruments adopted to advance democracy, governance and human rights. But beyond ratification, which is important, the countries of the Sahel must fulfill their treaty obligations by adopting the necessary measures, including uh, legislative, executive, and also administrative uh, measures to ensure the implementation of the principles proclaimed by the various charters. To, um, uh, to, um, to counter the challenges related to the implementation of the treaties, there are um, very important uh, elements. For instance, the, uh, the, the, the citizen participation in the definition and implementation of national human rights and development plan and policies, because this is absolutely crucial. Civil society's involvement is key in the preparation and realization of such plans, sensitization and public awareness. Funds and supports are required, of course. And we have to facilitate the development uh, of a new critical mass that can promote the things that have been said by the, the, the speakers before me. But let me take you for a moment uh, in the cell. Mm, activate your imagination, uh, please. Uh, what I would like to uh, announce is a specific scenario, a scenario that depicts the proliferation of initiatives related to the promotion and implementation of the rule of law, civil rights, lawyers, women organizations for legislative reforms and engaged in social activities such as domestic violence, media activists, youth organizations from human rights and justice, such a vibrant civil society, it's incredible how vibrant it is. I always visit them when I go to the region and I am in contact with them constantly. Of course, we always praise them. This is for effect, but, and I'm very much in line with Leymar and Gumbi for, for having mentioned this, we do not fund them sufficiently. Not only, we uh, have a difficult coordination with them. In most cases, they have co difficult coordination between them because the, it's very difficult to communicate in Africa, as you very, very well know, especially in the Sahel, there, are, uh, there is a lack of infrastructure and all the rest. The level of our coordination with the international organization is also lacking, and also the access to local authorities and uh, governments. So the civil society is vibrant, is a very much uh, working on its own because it's not sufficiently supported. 
SDGs uh, 16 is fundamental uh, as a framework because it is inclusive. It is, uh, uh, of course, uh, very important because the, the inclusiveness is a challenge. And what are the other challenges? The fact that we need a social contract. When we talk about governance, we talk about a social contract. We have in the region IDPs, refugees, marginalized people in remote areas, victims, and violence, it becomes a system, a system that produces an alternative welfare that also includes forms of justice. This is an oxymoron, but it is true. The context, of course, requires a new context a concept of democracy, which should be contextualized. And also, we should fight impunity because people uh, are reassured when they know that they can actually have access to um, structures of justice, because they feel that they can be proactive in the society. Going towards the conclusion, I can say that, uh, of course, uh, the European Union, uh, which I represent today, is uh, doing a lot. In the new strategy for the Sahel, the key words are governance, of course, uh, also partnership, but also civilian surge, which are the most important elements. But uh, I have to say that we are still far from implementing the real uh, strategies to, to obtain good results, especially because we are aiming at uh, the very famous nexus between security and development. And I would add sustainable development, which is the real challenge of the future, because sustainability is very far from being really implemented. So we need African research, African activism. We need a strong focus on processes in terms of justice and governance to achieve goals and implement objectives such as the elections. Processes are very, very important. And I would like to conclude by saying simply that only a, a more prismatic view will give us the opportunity. It's very difficult to have a prismatic view because often people are very concentrated on details. And we need this attitude, this approach. And I have to say that this exercise today, once again, and I want to praise uh, Idlo Undesa and, uh, of course, uh, my Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, Italy, are giving this opportunity. And this uh, is something we have to exploit as much as possible because it is a, a very precious opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. De. And special thanks for also giving us an idea of the rule of law tools that are available to everyone, including civil society, to work within uh, the system, but also for highlighting that um, respecting um, human rights and the rule of law is not only the right thing to do, but also the smart thing to do. So making really the business case for the rule of law and for human rights. Thank you. And I know that you may have to leave a little bit early. So thank, thank you sir. again in advance for, for your contribution. You. And it's a pleasure now to turn to our next speaker, who is Ms. Lynn Rose Gannon. Ms. Gannon, your combination of work in academia and civil society has created a network of young people in the conflict-affected Mindanao region to help educate and foster a culture of peace. We have seen the devastating impacts that conflict and war have on the lives of children and young people. In what ways do you see young people being most affected by conflict? And how can governments and the international community more meaningfully engage with a broad range of young people and youth networks to prevent conflict and sustain peace? The floor is yours. Thank you for the space. Um, having experienced um, violent conflict at the age of 13, uh, due to a failure of a peace agreement in my hometown in Lano del Norte, I resonate with a um, Vietnamese American poet in one of his books. He said that once war enters you, it never leaves, but merely echoes. It may be the horrible experience of needing to flee from home, leaving in evacuation sites, fearing another armed conflict, gunshots, friends being hostage. So remaking, rebuilding a world after violence suggests that violence has neat endings or that the act of remaking happens only after such endings are declared, which is not the case. The effects of conflict and violence are felt across time. 
its impact is holistic and the response to it, to it needs to be more holistic. I am Lynn Rose Henon. I'm from the Philippines. I work, I teach in a university in the southern part of the country. I am also an executive council member of Young Women Plus Leaders for Peace Initiative and a participant of the UNDP 16 by 16 Initiative, the group of 16 youth um, activists across the world who drafted and presented the Rome Call to Action in 2019, right in the same room which outlined the call to action, urging all stakeholders and partners to take bold and strong action in SDG 16 and empower young people. And some of the points in 2019 are also the points that I will be raising today. Youth affected by armed conflict and those living in disaster-stricken communities is faced with limited education opportunities and dire unemployment. In the Philippines, a large number of young people cannot find employment and earn a satis satisfactory income. And access to education, we'd like to emphasize this one, is fundamental for facilitating young people's positive engagement in sustainable development. The COVID-19 lockdowns have caused a substantial decline in the job market, compounding the COVID-19's impact on poverty in the Philippines. Last year, the youth unemployment rate in the country was 14.5, and that's roughly around 1.12 million young Filipinos were unemployed. A large number of this unemployed youth live in conflict-affected and post-conflict areas, which peace and security situations worsened in many parts across the country, even while the pandemic continues. These same communities are also vulnerable to natural disasters. And resonating Vice Minister Sereni in the opening program earlier, women and girls are still left behind during conflict, weakened institutions, poverty, and financial hardship leave young women and girls vulnerable to abuse, sexual exploitation, and violence. For instance, in um, displaced girls from conflict-affected areas of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao or BARM are more vulnerable to child marriage. This um, impacts their physical, mental, and psychosocial health, as well as make them prone to stigma, isolation, school dropouts, and extreme poverty. These are just some of the impacts of uh, conflict to the lives of young people. For, from where I am coming from, SDG 16 is not just our future, but it is our life. But despite and in spite of these things, we have seen young people at the front lines addressing these issues with meager resources, using both formal and non-formal spaces, building and sustaining peace. Like mentioned earlier, I work in two spaces I would like to believe. One is in the university, where we use, um, we initiate um, activities to empower uh, young people to, to co-create peace in their communities. In 2018, we initiated Project Yakap or Youth Amplifying and Co-Creating and Advocating Peace, which is a leadership and mentorship program for youth affected by the Marawi siege. We are also currently implementing the SDG mainstreaming initiative that created an information, conversation, and networking hub on SDGs. Activities include SDG talks, which translates the global goals to local experiences, highlighting local challenges and initiative towards um, the goals. So in our mobilization and capacity building work, we have seen that despite normative policy developments for in increased youth participation and inclusion in peace building, operational deficiencies and disparities of youth are still unacceptably high. So here are my, my recommendations. I think number one is the local turn in youth-led peace building. Peace and security efforts at the local level, level are what will keep policy commitments and government promises operational. So we need to recognize, support, amplify local youth peace building initiatives. And I'm referring to programs that young people control and lead in their own communities. Also, it is, I think, critical to invest in young people's capacities, agency, and leadership, and facilitate an enabling environment for youth organizations and initiatives through substantial funding support, network building, and capacity strengthening, which I think my fellow panelists also highlighted earlier. Another thing is meaningful youth inclusion. This is, this is not just about bringing more young people on the table, but this is bringing more diverse youth on the table. Inclusion is trusting young people's agency. It is reaching youth beyond usual um, young people that often participate in UN processes. 
young people in the Philippines, for instance, tend to be more engaged in informal processes as young people themselves are seldom included in formal peace process. This impacts young people's political participation and contributes to the youth's growing mistrust of govern governance institutions. We also, in terms of inclusion, we also need to encourage and support and create an enabling environment for more young people in leadership roles. It is crucial that governments make sustained commitments to rebuild young people's trust and confidence in governments. The leadership of young people needs to be recognized, invested in, and amplified. And I think the last point is addressing the violence of exclusion. The systemic exclusion of youth, despite the policy commitments and government promises, puts distrust at the heart of youth and state relations. The backsliding of democratic governance in many parts of the world, including the Philippines, has been accompanied by loose of trust in governments and represented democracy by youth in particular. Young people require a safe space, both literally and metaphorically, in which to exercise our agency and voice, as well as enabling environment in which to actively participate in development processes that affects us now and in the future. So we emphasize this also, like what I said in our Rome call to action in 2019, and I'm repeating it now, that the 2030 agenda's recognition of youth as critical agents of peace should translate into bold action by governments and other stakeholders to respond to young people's specific needs, as well as to recognize, promote, and support young people's role as partners to SDG implementation, monitoring, and review, particularly to, for those who are most likely to face discrimination and exclusion. Thank you very much for this space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Lynn Rose. Uh, what a powerful message. You have reminded us of the effects and social impacts of war uh, and how the youth is often the victim of uh, such effects, but also of the fact that the young people can be very powerful agents of change, provided that they have the proper space, the enabling environment, and the space to participate in these processes. So very powerful message. Thank you so much for that. We're now turning to our next panelist, uh, Mr. Helder da Costa, the General Secretary of the G7 Plus Secretariat. Mr. da Costa, you lead an organization of 20 fragile and post-conflict affected countries, ranging from the Pacific, Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean. It is a platform for sharing lessons and experiences among fragile and conflict affected states to support each other through peer learning in the self-led transition from fragility to resilience, based on volunteerism, solidarity, and cooperation. Based on your experience, what interventions are available to conflict affected states and how can such interventions protect against complex and acute drivers of conflict, such as climate change, inequality and exclusion? The floor is yours. Thank you. First of all, on behalf of the G7+, Plus, my intergovernment organization, which is also a permanent observer at the United Nations, I'd like to thank the organizers for having me here to this important conference for the second time. <clears throat> I was here in 2019 before COVID. As we are about to start living in the post-COVID life, we witnessed the tragic war in Ukraine instigated by Russia as echoed by other prominent speakers here. <clears throat> In addition to the direct suffering of the innocent people in Ukraine, the negative impact of this war has already been felt around the world. The conflict affected countries, such as my organization, uh, member states of 20 countries, are at the front of the negative consequences of the war. Curfews, lockdowns, and closure of borders were not necessarily new to the citizens of my member states. Take the example of Afghanistan, Yemen, Central African Republic, South Sudan, Somalia, Guinea-Bissau, or even Liberia from the uh, home country of my sister here from the Nobel Peace Laureate in 2011. 
The G7 Plus, as you mentioned, comprises of 20 member states. If you look at the trajectory of those countries over the last few years, it has been full of suffering and difficulties due to war and conflicts. We all can visualize and imagine the sufferings of the difficulties uh, the cities in these countries have gone through. So to, we, to answer your question, Madam Moderator, allow me just to share with you some experiences, perspectives of the G7 plus countries using some of the interventions with a very low cost. I was inspired by Ms. Lema Boy's um, remarks early on that support the grassroots level activities is very important. Here, what we, the G7 Plus, we can also attest to, that using the very low cost initiatives, such as promoting peace and reconciliation and dialogue at the grassroots level, as well as at the national level and subnational level, will definitely pay peace dividend to the citizens at the country level. I say this because we have already engaged in the Central African Republic, bringing the protagonists of the war coming out from a country to a neutral place, and it works. Unfortunately, this couldn't uh, be replicated in Afghanistan because Afghanistan is completely a different set of game because it is a proxy war. So my contribution to this discussion is that the, the national dialogue and reconciliation is the most affordable way to address the existing conflicts uh, in the fragile states. Second, we all hear about the conflict prevention. Secretary General of the United Nations, also his main agenda for his second term in his, this, as the Secretary General, he focused on conflict prevention rather than conflict resolution. However, the more we hear about conflict prevention, it has never been stronger as the latest OECD report, which focus on fragility. So conflict prevention is political and manifested in, in political phenomenon in very uh, broad areas. And allow me also to share with you a personal experience that among the experience that we face within the G7 plus countries, there, there is hope to be shared among ourselves, like you mentioned about the fragile to fragile cooperation. My home country, Timor Leste, just got an election for the second round of election two days ago. And the result is that a Nobel Peace Laureate, Dr. Jose Ramzorta, was elected by the people in a very resounding victory as the new elect, president elect, another Nobel Peace Laureate. So, what lesson can we draw from there? Can you imagine many brothers and sisters from Africa here, if you have this election in Africa with so many disputed uh, outcome, it could retaliate each other. It could provide conflict uh, in, 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 many, in some of African countries. We've seen this in Guinea-Bissau and elsewhere. But coming from a t my country, uh, to only 20 years of getting independence 20 years ago, and then having successfully done the elections in a very prudent and fair and objective, it could also provide lessons learned to other countries as well. What inspires uh, the, the experience of Timor Leste? First and foremost, since we're talking about SDG 16 here, it is the importance of fair and accountable institution. And what institutions comprise in the, in the elections process. Of course, the National Commission election or technical secretariat for the, uh, for the elections. So those are the institutions that could also be strengthened in order to provide a fair and equitable outcome uh, so that people can trust the institutions and therefore they can also go and vote. Another important lesson that we could also uh, learn from here is regarding your question, Madam Moderator, what are the interventions. It is about the trust of the people towards the public institution. When you provide transparent information, when you provide the most equitable about information, how you, you manage the information, not necessarily coming only from the government, but also from the civil society, the media, the academia, 
then you can guarantee the uh, successful elections in your country. And last but not least, I would say that instead of asking what is the relation between climate change, conflict, it is much better to ask what's the political consequences of dealing with climate change in any given country. When you analyze this, it will differ from one country to another. So my humble solution to this last question is that it is again investment in the national institutions, for example, national disaster management or uh, other institutions dealing with, uh, for example, social protection, civil protection in order to mitigate the risks. I'll, I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Da Costa. And uh, thank you also for introducing sorry. us I'm to- sorry. Thank, I'm very, very sorry. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for Mr. Da Costa introducing us to a concept um, which is fundamental for uh, building peace and maintaining peace, which is the importance of having uh, strong, accountable and fair institutions. And this is something that we will be also discussing in our next panel. So I'm very happy that you introduced us to this concept now uh, to, uh, to really underline the importance of supporting national mechanisms such as the ones that you have mentioned. Um, so thank you for that. Now um, we are going to turn to our online uh, panelists. And I'm very uh, happy and privileged to uh, turn our, to our next panelist, His Excellency Minister Hassan, who leads the implementation of strategies for sustainable development and economic growth in Somalia. Minister, a key priority of your administration has been the development of reliable and more accessible data gathering and reporting mechanisms. How has the Somali government used these tools to understand the differential impacts of COVID-19 on human security across social groups? And how is this transformation being used in Somalia's policy response? His Excellency, uh, Minister Hassan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, honorable guests. Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be taking part in this year's SDG 16 conference, jointly organized by the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs and the International Development Law Organization and the Government of Italy. Distinguished delegates, over the past two years, Somalia has deeply felt the compounded impacts of the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. As we all know, the country's health landscape has been adversely affected by state fragility, poor infrastructure, inadequate equipment, and limited health professional workforce. This pandemic has exposed these fragilities and exacerbated the effects on our society. Increasingly, climate-related uh, climate change related disasters such as droughts, floods, and infestation of logs have displaced millions of Somalis and driven many more to the brink of famine. The war in Ukraine has exacerbated the situation in Somalia. More than 90% of our wheat comes from Russia and Ukraine. The price of wheat went up by 200%, making it very difficult for people to afford, thus contributing to an already dire situation a drought situation, I should say. In the midst of this climate characterized by conflict dynamics, food insecurity, natural disasters and health shocks, our efforts to promote justice, peace and stability in order to achieve sustainable development is quite a challenge. However, we at the federal government of Somalia have attempted to address these challenges on a more long-term strategic manner. This is evident in our national, ninth national development plan, NDP-9, which we formulated with the overarching aim of drawing the nation's path towards economic growth and poverty reduction through the implementation of justice, rule of law, peace, and security. NDP 9, which is fully aligned with SDG 16, is designed to allow everyone to have equal access to justice and rule of law, specifically 
the most vulnerable members of the society, including women and children. To further expand on this, NDP9 is strategically structured around four pillars, inclusive and accountable politics, improved security and rule of law, inclusive economic growth, including increased employment, and improved social development. We formulated this plan and based it on, on these four pillars because we firmly believe that long-term peace, sustainable development, and substantial poverty reduction cannot be achieved unless accompanied by ample access to justice and rule of law. Therefore, Pillar 1 of the National Development Plan addresses political fragility in Somalia and focuses on inclusive politics, outlining strategies and interventions that strengthen the effectiveness of political processes in Somalia, thereby increasing inclusivity and reducing violent conflicts. Similarly, Pillar 2 of the National Development Plan focuses on security and the rule of law, puts forward a number of strategies and interventions that are used insecurity across the country and strengthen citizens' access to equitable and affordable systems of justice. To, to, to bridge the gap, or, or basically to make sure data is available and accessible in Somalia, two years ago we have created our first National Statistics Bureau, which is tasked to compile, collect, and, and produce official statistics to make sure that the numbers reported in Somalia to outside or to outside Somalia are accurate and respond to the actual needs on the ground. Somalia will continue to honor its commitment to making progress on sustainable development goals and their principles. As I've just explained, efforts have been made to align and embed the SDGs into our national plan, as well as within the monitoring and evaluation frameworks. And these frameworks are fully aligned with the SDGs all the way uh, from bottom up to the top, making sure that the plans from district, regional level, and national level are all fully aligned with the SDGs. And, and we make sure that the evaluation frameworks also align with those with the SDGs. We firmly believe that leveraging the 2330 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its tools is a direct investment into Somalia's trajectory towards sustainable development, poverty reduction, and economic growth. Our gathering here today reaffirms our need to continue to embrace these goals and work harder towards their attainment globally. It's my belief that they provide a crucial basis for building and sustaining development, especially in conflict within contexts. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Your Excellency, for your insightful intervention and also for sharing how your country is taking a more strategic approach to respond to the shocks of war. We have heard again about food insecurity, health shocks, the challenges of war and how it affects um, your situation on the ground. So thank you uh, very much for your intervention, much appreciated. Um, let me now turn to our next panelist, uh, Ms. Elizabeth Spehar the UN Assistant Secretary General for Peacebuilding Support. Ms. Pehar, you were recently appointed Assistant Secretary General for Peacebuilding Support, building on a distinguished career spent leading political and peacebuilding initiatives, including in Cyprus, as chief of the first ever UN peacekeeping mission led by women. In your experience, what are the benefits of including historically underrepresented groups, including women and youth in peace building processes and dialogues? And how do such efforts contribute to peaceful, just and inclusive societies? The floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And I would also like to join the other panelists in thanking uh, the government of Italy and the International Development and Law Organization for the invitation uh, and for this very important uh, event. Um, I have to say that being one of the, uh, the last speakers in the panel has the advantage or, or perhaps disadvantage of uh, much already having been said, uh, but I will uh, try to uh, build on what uh, on the very uh, many important points uh, that uh, some of the previous speakers um, have made in relation to your question. So first of all, I would like to emphasize uh, the importance of inclusivity in everything uh, we do uh, at the United Nations. It's importance for peace and security, 
and for the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development overall, uh, which uh, our Deputy Secretary General mentioned at the outset of this, of this meeting. In terms of peace building, we feel that if we want to be investing in sustainable outcomes, we have to engage all sectors of society because we know that we need all perspectives and we need to understand the concerns and the needs of all of those who are affected by conflict or fragility. So in terms of women and youth, which you were mentioning, we feel that it makes particular sense uh, to include them and it's also the right thing to do. Uh, now, I think that Lema and Lynn Rose before me on this panel have spoken already quite eloquently to that, and I will try to um, uh, emphasize and perhaps reinforce some of the points that, that they made. Uh, we know, for example, that women make up over half of most societies. Uh, so for me, the question has all, always been, well, how could we possibly leave them out? Um, we know also, and um, uh, Lema alluded to this, that in fragile and conflict affected contexts around the world, women and girls are being differently and disproportionately impacted by the, by the situation, by the conflicts. This is why not only do we need to bring women in, we need to include them, but we also have to bring a gender lens to everything we do. We need to look at uh, the, the gendered aspects of a conflict or a fragile situation through our analysis we need to take it into account in terms of our policy making and certainly in terms of our actions to address the problems. In the case of women and girls, I think we also have to recognize that they are facing structural inequalities in most societies that have held back their potential and their full and equal uh, participation in societies for centuries. And I think that it, by having this situation, we have also in many respects held back the potential of our own societies as, as a whole. Um, similarly, and we heard again very eloquently from Lynn Rose on, on this aspect, the participation of young people cannot be ignored. If we look at the conflict and fragile uh, uh, context that we work in, in, in so many places, young people make up the majority of the population. Uh, so that's a key variable right off, off the start. And we've also seen that when young people aren't part of the solution and when they face a situation of no viable prospects for the future, so no jobs, no chances for study, no prospects overall, then they can also easily fall prey to joining the violence, to becoming part of the conflict actors. And this is all uh, also where I think the full range of the SDGs comes in. We are talking about through the SDGs, leaving no one behind. And in this sense, we know that inclusivity is vital for peace building because we, we've seen that exclusion, marginalization and inequalities among groups in a society are serious risk factors for violent conflict. So secondly, let me drill down a little bit uh, on the, the, the point of the benefits of inclusivity and its contribution to peace building and to peaceful, just and inclusive societies, which was part of your, your question. We do have a wide body of research already over the last decade uh, or two decades at least uh, and our past practice, which has shown that when women are included in the design, the negotiation and the implementation of peace agreements, uh, this can lead to much more sustainable uh, outcomes. Uh, similarly, women's inclusion also expands the range of constituencies that are engaged in a process, and that tends to strengthen the legitimacy and credibility of a process. It also helps with community buy-in in support of the implementation of an outcome. We also know that when women are involved there's usually a better quantity and quality of specific gender provisions in peace agreements. And that includes in, in the, including in the ceasefires, peace agreements, implementation mechanisms, national dialogues, and so forth. And when that happens, we have a much better chance of ensuring that these, these um, tools, these mechanisms will be responsive to the needs of all of the, the community members. Now, in terms of youth, 
there's a simple uh, a similar potential positive impact and that is that young people can connect much more easily to their peers and therefore they can support in conflict affected situations the prevention and resolution of conflicts uh, they can help to counter violent extremism and help to build social co cohesion when they are directly involved in in processes um, we've also seen that young people's engagements during uh, all phases of peace processes also help to increase the sustainability of agreements by pay playing a positive role to socialize defend and protect those agreements and they can be involved in either informal or formal dialogue processes. I know an earlier speaker mentioned that, that young people are often not involved formally at the table. I'm hoping that this will change over time, but even in informal dialogue processes, they can have a very uh, important and, and clear uh, impact. So thirdly, I'd like to summarize how inclusion efforts, how we feel inclusion efforts contribute to peaceful, just and inclusive societies and mention a few examples of what we've uh, been able to support uh, through uh, the peace building fund here at the United Nations. So first of all, and some of the other speakers have touched on this, inclusion in peace building processes and in institutions, which is called for in, in SDG 16, as several have also mentioned, this inclusion provides a sense of ownership to those who are included, and it gives them a sense of agency over their own destiny. This, I feel, is the opposite of hopelessness and disengagement, and it makes peace building and our necessary, our key institutions, much more solid and sustainable. Secondly, inclusion in peace building processes and in decision making in institutions helps to build trust in those processes and in those institutions. And we have also heard from other speakers the importance of, 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 of trust. This is critical because we know that in fragile and conflict affected uh, contexts, trust in basic institutions and the social fabric of a society are often the first to go and that will weaken recovery. And here I want to emphasize another point that's come up a few times and that is the critical importance of community level peace building and therefore of strengthening local peace building capacities including women's groups, uh, youth led groups and other underrepresented groups. And thirdly, when you're bringing in more actors that are more representative of the society as a whole, you are enlarging, I feel, the toolkit, if you will, of those actors who can make a difference. Now, uh, allow me to perhaps give you a few examples of how we've tried to support inclusion uh, to, build, to build peace. For example, in Niger, through the Secretary General's Peace Building Fund, which I manage on his behalf, um, we have supported UN Women and FAO to uh, work on uh, with the local communities on local peace structures. And these local peace structures have resolved hundreds of locally um, generated conflicts, for example, between farmers and herders through voluntary informal groups led by women mediators. In South Sudan, uh, as another example, the Peace Building Fund has supported UN agencies uh, to engage with women's groups and police to enhance security and reduce gender-based violence. This has meant directly investing financial resources in support of local groups, including women and women-led initiatives and promoting young people as agents of peace. And again, the funding issue, the issue of resources and support has come up repeatedly and uh, I, I fully agree with, with, with that point. In the Central African Republic, again, supported by the Peace Building Fund, UN Women, UNFPA, and Search for Common Ground, an NGO, uh, worked with young people who helped to raise awareness of the peace accord among the rural uh, population, and that enhanced the ownership and acceptance of the peace uh, accord. Um, we have something in the Peace Building Fund called uh, the uh, Annual Gender and Youth Promotion Initiatives. And we use these uh, initiatives to support um, NGOs, youth-led and women-led organizations to directly make an impact uh, on peace. And this year, the uh, Gender Promotion Initiative is calling for proposals focused on supporting women civil society organizations directly the groups and networks, 
uh, to strengthen their institutional capacity for sustainable contributions to peace building. And the youth initiative this year is seeking proposals folks focused on fostering youth inclusive political processes and promoting the political participation of diverse young people. That was another point made by, um, uh, by Lynn Rose about the diversity of young people as well. Um, and promoting safety, security and protection of diverse young people. Again, a point that Lynn Rose uh, made very, very eloquently. Um, let me start wrapping up by um, coming to my final point, and uh, that is uh, the point on, on financing. Again, funding was raised by a number of you. We, we do have the stats and we know that war is very costly. Conflict is extremely expensive. Cleaning up the mess, so to speak, is very, very cost prohibitive. Uh, in terms of, um, of refugee flows, of rebuilding infrastructure, rebuilding lives. Prevention and peace building is very cost effective. However, if you look at where the money is going, uh, it is going disproportionately, uh, first of all, to war. We know there are trillions of dollars being spent every year on, on military equipment. Uh, secondly, also on conflict management but much less on prevention and peace building. We're hoping that this will change. And I want to flag for those who are not aware that next week there will be a high level meeting on financing for peace building in the UN General Assembly. And the idea is that member states will deliberate and hope, hopefully decide on how they might uh, better secure what we feel is needed, which is more adequate, predictable and sustained funding uh, for, for peace building. I also hope that uh, this that the um, member states, when they're deliberating next week, will uh, also try to make some specific commitments uh, on, on funding for inclusivity. What I mean by that is that I would love to see uh, a commitment, for example, by member states to doubling to 30% the current target that the Secretary General set of at least 15% of investments in peace building dedicated specifically to advancing gender equality and the empowerment of women. I would also love to see a specific target for youth in peace building in terms of funding and support, which doesn't exist uh, at, at the moment. So with that, uh, I will um, just again, end with, with my thanks and hope that uh, this contributes uh, to our, uh, our discussions and our Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Behar, for your important contribution. Uh, let me move um, immediately to our next panelist, who is Mr. Diego Garcia Sayan, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Independence of Judges and Lawyers. Uh, Mr. Garcia Sayan, you are exceptionally well placed to speak on the relationship between politics and the judiciary, having served as Minister of Justice of Peru as well as judge of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights for two terms. What responsibilities do political and justice actors have to support judicial independence today? And how, in your experience, can judicial independence contribute through upholding the rule of law to peace building, reconciliation, and conflict prevention? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning for everybody. And thank you for the invitation to share with you some, some views and, and, and concerns. Uh, of course, after all what we have heard uh, this morning for me, I'm in Peru, or this afternoon for you, um, many relevant things have been already been said, as Elizabeth Specker has just uh, mentioned. So I, would, I just will try to, to, to insist in certain aspects that are absolutely crucial. Um, a functioning judicial, judiciary is essential so to prevent uh, conflict, so to process conflict that is more or less obvious. But a functioning judiciary means that uh, it should uh, promote rule of law, it should guarantee rights of, of everybody, due process, and prevent uh, crime and corruption. For, but for all this to, to work, the judiciary should be independent. It's not a machinery that has uh, no connection with this crucial value, which is independent. What has happened in the world as an impact of the, one of the several uh, aspects uh, in which the pandemic has eroded a uh, rule of law has because many situations that have been 
worldwide present, like uh, for instance, the increase of violence against the women, increase of domestic violence, and the uh, limited capacities that most society have had to react and to process this new set of uh, situations. And of course, the new wave of corruption in some countries I have heard uh, the, the, the wording billionaires of the COVID billionaires, which uh, exceptional uh, uh, public funds that have in many cases been um, part of uh, bribes and, 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 and corruption by the certain, certain individuals. Huh? Uh, how can judicial independence contribute to peace building, reconciliation and conflict prevention? Many relevant things have, 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 have been said in, in, in this matter, but I would, uh, in, in a matter of time, you have not too many minutes uh, remaining, uh, mention three aspects that may be, may be, may be crucial. Uh, the first, that it is absolutely essential that the public institutions, the judicial uh, machinery has legitimacy. So that's the only way through which it can work as an effective system to prevent and process conflicts. Uh, legitimacy that requires many components. One of them, of course, is independence, due process, uh, and, and that the machinery works. Second, uh, access, access to justice. Many of my, uh, of my the colleagues have already mentioned this, but it is absolutely crucial. Access uh, to justice for all, and especially uh, to vulnerable groups, especially uh, for women in certain situation, for indigenous groups in which uh, conflict, gender, uh, by, by violence has dramatically increased in several parts of the world after and during the pandemic. But real access to justice is essential so that the uh, uh, society believes that that is the way through which conflicts can be prevented or, or processed. And then a question that is raising increasing concern, at least very clearly in Latin America, in which uh, eventually unemployment and poverty is one of the major concerns in societies that is being gradually and very quickly replaced by the uh, concerns about insecurity, about the increase of crime as one of the major threats we perceive as so by, by the society in which is a kind of uh, major proof uh, of, the of the institutional capacity to prevent and confront crime inside the uh, context of rule of law, of due process, of respect of human rights, and not following the, the, the temptation of uh, justice uh, applied just without all, all those um, uh, basic, uh, basic uh, guarantees. And this has to do, again, in, with uh, certain international standards besides independence uh, of justice, which has to do with how is, uh, is the world uh, better prepared or not now to act against corruption, to prevent corruption and to react against corruption. Uh, we have one of the best uh, uh, international treaties that have been adopted in the last uh, decades, which is the UN Convention Against Corruption. The UN Convention Against Corruption not only describes what to do in general terms, but includes as a, as a, as a component, as a crucial component that the state parties had ratified uh, some months ago in its session take, taking place in, in the General Assembly in, in New York, uh, that uh, to, to have an effective uh, UN Convention Against Corruption, you need independent justice. The, the state parties have mentioned that basic principles for independence of justice is one of the main uh, instruments to have uh, an, an effective um, uh, action against corruption. So if you combine all this process in which legitimacy, access by everybody and especially by vulnerable, group, the vulnerable groups, touching efficiently uh, uh, dramatic uh, threats against uh, humankind like, uh, like, like corruption, all of them require this component of independence, which is not uh, a question that is referred only for the rights uh, of lawyers and judges, but a basic right mainly uh, for society. So uh, that, that would be 
I, I, I think in which after all that what we have for the, this morning, this afternoon, that we can finally uh, conclude as one uh, basic uh, component for the future. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Uh, and uh, thank you for all the, the fantastic presentations we have heard uh, today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Gertzesayan, for your uh, presentation and also for introducing the, uh, the, the, the discussion and the element of uh, the fight against corruption, which is so uh, important um, also to ensure processes of justice, something that we will discuss um, today and tomorrow throughout the, the panels. Um, now, we are running a little bit late, but I see from the chat that there are so many questions, and uh, I would like to take the opportunity to at least uh, present to the panel um, three brief questions for, for your consideration, because our uh, audience is so, so active, so we cannot just conclude without taking a few questions. I actually have um, in the speakers list one question from the live audience uh, here in Rome. Um, so I am um, inviting uh, to take the floor Ms. Uh, Rita Martin Lopidia of the Organization for Women Development of uh, South Sudan. Uh, Ms. Rita Martin, you are here. Uh, so thank you very much. The floor uh, is yours. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the space, as well as the uh, very brilliant panelist. Um, I, my question goes to Lima. Um, listening to you share the recommendation and the experience that you have makes me reflect on what is happening in South Sudan. As women activists, we know that it is an uphill task. Uh, during uh, conflict and uh, peace negotiations in which you have to push for every single thing. And it is actually a very tiresome process. And uh, after the, the, the peace is signed, you get into the implementation phase where it has a long range of challenges. Uh, you experience the backlash on some of the gains that you have during the negotiation or in the peace agreement. And then the space keep on shrinking uh, during the implementation phase because everybody is in the same place and there are things that you cannot even talk about as it was during the negotiation. So I wanted to get your experiences. How was it like in Liberia after the peace agreement, the implementation of the peace agreement, how did women continue to push until we see democracy taking shape in your country? Because South Sudan is going through a transition and there is a lot of backlash already uh, for the women's movement. And uh, the backlash plus the burnout of women activists where there is fatigue, no enough funding, and a lot of challenges that the civil society generally face. So I would like to hear your, your insights and also your recommendations on how to build during um, or after negotiations and the implementation of the peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we are going to take a second question and then I'm going to give the floor to the panel. Uh, we have a question online from uh, a colleague from the Local Government Training Institute of Tanzania, and Gomange Merkiad is asking, uh, in some countries, leaders have strong political will to develop and sustain peace, but the capability of people, especially young people, to understand and participate in development plans and policies is insufficient. So this is a question for Lynn Rose. What can be done to make them aware of relevant development plans and policies at the local, national, and global levels? And uh, finally, finally, we have also a question uh, for uh, Mr. Da Costa. Um, uh, Christer Stormo of the Paris School of Economics is asking, how could a people-centered approach to justice 
be sensitive to the particular justice needs of groups who are actually facing the threats of conflict and violence. So how, we can, how can we ensure that our justice systems are sensitive to the needs of people currently uh, under threat? Um, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, one of the things that we tend to see, and I spoke about it briefly, um, how people see peace processes. Once peace agreements are signed, people tend to believe that peace has been delivered to a particular space. So the level of strength, endurance, ferocity that women put into advocating for signing the peace agreement comes down a bit. In our case in Liberia, when the peace agreement was signed, we took into consideration the, the literacy rate or the literacy rate of our country. Absolutely was gonna be impossible for women to read the over 300 page document. So we asked those in the room if they could set benchmarks. Of course, no one was going to set benchmarks for us. So immediately after the signing of the agreement, we took that agreement, brought women leaders who understood, and we broke it down into space, into times and seasons and phases, and set benchmarks with dates to say, when this time comes and we use it as our advocacy tool in different communities with women, between Jan November and December, there should be disarmament. And these are the things that you should see happening. If you don't see them happening, protests. During this time and that time, if you don't see this happening, but until we continue the advocacy around peace, knowing again that peace is not just the absence of war, but the presence of conditions that dignifies lives, we will continue to miss the mark. And with the case of South Sudan, because I've been involved, I know that people tend to relax easily once the agreements were signed. It's time for them to pick it on. Women need to come together in a collaborative way. Also, the temptation to work in silo now because every group is looking for money and the donors have a way, not every donor, but some of the conditions that they put down for funding tend to make it very easy for women to be at each other's throat. Um, once I said to some people in the EU, it would be very necessary or important if they could put some requirements for local community groups to be paired with groups in the capital city to apply for donor funding for peace and security work for women. But I think you need sustained advocacy, don't give up. We are going to the fourth cycle of elections next year in Liberia. This is something that has never happened in our country in his history. And in the fourth cycle of elections, we're going with the same energy that we took to the peace process. I hope it helps. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, Lynn Rose, over to you for a one minute reflection. Thank you. And I think I think my response to, to that question is investing in local actors. And most of the work that we do in Mindanao is that. And I think empowerment, making young people own these um, UN agenda, global agenda, bringing them home, translating into language that young people can relate and, and uh, that they can concretely imagine uh, how this impacts their life is very, very helpful. And I think, uh, you know, like working on um, ownership so that young people can, can co-own it and, and be part of co-creating what these agendas uh, agendas are. And I think also for young people, we need to hold and take space, maybe online, offline, does it have to be huge? And most of the work that we do are gathering 15 people in community talking about what youth peace and security is and what SDG 16 and how they are linked together and why it impacts, why we need to talk about uh, this one. So thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, finally, Mr. Da Costa, your final one minute reflection. Thank you. <clears throat> the, regarding the, uh, how can we ensure um, people who are under threat uh, to justice? Uh, I think experience in our member states, in particular in fragile and conflict affected states, show that uh, you need to have a fair access to justice, regardless of uh, the, uh, the, the, the root causes. So uh, here, the victims, in particular women, children, and all people who are sexually ass assaulted and so on, 
need to be brought to uh, justice by the justice actors. Uh, uh, actors. Now, final point, uh, in order to show the legitimacy as uh, Mr. the other panelists online mentioned, you need to have a legitimacy in the uh, justice sector. So uh, in the, it, there is no exception for fragile states that uh, the legitimacy is there. It's just a matter of having, uh, boosting the trust and the confidence by the local people towards the justice institutions in order to bring those who perpetrate the, the crime into justice and trial. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And so we're coming to the conclusion of this session, and I would like to thank all panelists and the audience for your insights. We have heard a number of excellent points, and I will summarize the most pertinent ones at the conference reporting back session tomorrow. So I hope you will join us at the next session as we look at ways to build institutional resilience and enhance the effectiveness and accountability of institutions. So thanks again. I will uh, close the panel now, but I have also um, a, a housekeeping uh, announcement. We will take now a five minutes break. Um, there is a, an open coffee space both today and tomorrow uh, in the two rooms next to the conference, one on your left and one on your right hand side. In light of COVID-19 requirement, uh, it will be important to make sure we split uh, in the two rooms more or less equally. Um, and, uh, and that was the announcement. So thank you so much for your attention today. And uh, I'll see you soon in the next panel. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>